You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Gore in Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Sigmas arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang. Joining me, as always, is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, that's Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie is our professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and our local protector of the night sky. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, certainly. So this will be Friday, January 7th, so the first Friday in the new year. Uh, so basically the days are just starting to get a little bit longer, like one minute per day. So you probably won't really notice it yet. Actually, it's interesting. The sunrise is 714, and that's the latest sunrise you're going to get for the whole year even though we're two weeks past the solstice. And so that doesn't change right away. And then the early sunset times start two weeks before the solstice. So the sunset times are moving back. It's about 420 now instead of 359. And of course that is because of the, the way we're tilted at 23 and a half degrees and the fact that we orbit an ellipsis. If it was just a perfect circle and if we weren't tilted, then you would have exactly that matching up all the time. But we have that offset of about two weeks in both directions. All right, so the days are getting slightly longer. Uh, we're going to have a waxing crescent moon, which is basically the best phase because it's up there, you get the earth shine, and then it gets out of the way before midnight and you can see some other stuff. It's actually just two days before first quarter when it, does, it doesn't get out of the way till, till midnight. So we get that going on and we had a really nice setup of planets just a little while ago, but we still have a few left. We have Jupiter and Saturn and Mercury is still up. Mercury is actually going to be getting even closer to Saturn in a few more days. So try to watch for that. We lost Venus a little while ago. And then Mars is a morning planet, so we got that. And um, there might be a few leftover quadranted meteors up there still that peaked on the 4th. Um, it was a pretty narrow peak. Actually, we weren't going to get as many as the other, the Asian side of the world, that we're going to get more meteors. Um, so Mercury's interesting. If you've never really seen that planet, um, it's not always fainter, but it's always pretty low because it's near the sun. So it's about 3,000 miles in diameter which actually makes it smaller than two of our moons. Ganymede is 3,200 and Titan's about a little over 3,000. So it's smaller than two of the moons in our solar system. So it's a pretty neat planet. And then it's pretty, it's gonna get close to Saturn, like I said, and then both Saturn and Mercury are gonna disappear in about another week. So definitely try to catch that. And then basically I can give you a short update on the James Webb Space Telescope. We both actually watched that launch live at 7.20 in the morning. So that was pretty neat that you know, everyone can watch it on a replay, but it means a lot more when you see it live. So it's doing well as far as I know right now, of course we're recording this a little earlier. So there's actually a website that we're gonna post that and give you all the details. Uh, but basically it's almost, as of the 28th, almost a third of the way there. It's 300,000 miles away. It only has a little less than a million miles to go total. It's gonna slow down its pace as it gets further out to where it's going. Um, one of the communications antennas already unfolded is working great. And some of the, um, the sun shield or one of the shields has, has already unfolded, not the entire shield that the size of the tennis court. Um, the, the thing, you know, the actual mirrors and all that hasn't been put together yet. But right now everything's working great. And of course the launch was a big step, but there's lots of other big steps for it to, still to go through. So you can keep track of that for yourself. So that'd be kind of neat too. Awesome, thanks Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, there's still lots of exciting things to come with the James Webb Telescope, so I'm sure we'll be continuing to provide updates as as time moves on. Yes, definitely. And its ultimate goal is to get to L2, right? Yep. Yep. And that'll take about a whole month from December 25th. Sweet. And then it starts calibrating every one of the 18 mirror segments, has little actuators, so they can bring it into focus while it's up there, which is a good thing because you couldn't do that with a Hubble. It was just one mirror and it was out of focus so they couldn't move it they had to go there physically i mean it was designed to do that <laughs> but it's kind of neat that they designed the mirror for the web to have little actuators that you can move it from the earth a million miles away and make it bring it in perfect focus yeah. almost as if it was right in front of you doing that a million miles away right and then that's built in perfection as long as something else doesn't go wrong <laughs> the, the focus part will work we have to worry about all the other stuff unfolding you know but once you get it unfolded i think it's in pretty good shape yeah yeah Awesome. 
Yep. And if you could not take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. Mm -hmm. So today's show, um, Happy New Year, everyone. It's uh, the 7th, as Bernie mentioned. And today we we wanted to celebrate a, um, well, I guess we could, we could call her a fellow STEM advocate, um, a fellow communicator of the sciences, and, um, you know, just one of the many people in the community that are doing kind of what we are trying to do here at on WMPG is to just try to encourage people to get interested, be excited about the sciences, and hopefully spark an interest in our listeners to want to learn more about whatever topic it is that we we come up with and and do one of our thirty minute segments on. Is that that that's kind of like our mission, right? Is just to yep. get people excited, right? Yeah, because we have a much wider range now than what we used to be called radio astronomy. Yeah. Now we can cover all kinds of amazing things. So that's one thing I really like about this new yeah. format. Um, and as all of you listeners know, both Bernie and I are very passionate about um, STEM education, and um, we wanted to highlight and start off the year with um, an overview, a kind of a, you know a, a review, I guess, of of a fellow STEM advocate, and her name is yeah, Dr. Kate Beaverdorf, better known as Kate the Chemist. So it's a much easier Love way to keep it or you can mangle that name. <laughs> but everyone can remember Kate the chemist. Yes, yes. So. And Kate, um, she, Dr. Kate, actually, she has a PhD in inorganic chemistry, and she currently is a professor over at the University of Texas. And um, her dissertation was on the direct comparison of homogeneous and heterogeneous palladium catalysts for the Suzuki Miyota cross blink huh. reactions. What does that okay. mean? <laughs> I, I didn't look up that detail. So I'm glad you mentioned that. But <laughs> um, and we can go into that just a little bit more. I didn't have too much on her dissertation. Um, she doesn't talk about it too much either. Um, <laughs> but she was born Kate Crawford in Portage in Michigan near yep. Kalamazoo. I think she mm -hmm. she claims Kalamazoo as her hometown. Yep. And, um, you know, I think she kind of self-described as Self described herself as generally being kind of a tomboy, often, you know, getting in trouble. Um, but one thing she really, really highlighted was that she always liked to push the limits. And um, her mom, I guess, was very supportive of her home chemistry experiments that she would do, <laughs> like mixing, mixing different um, chemicals that are around the house. Nothing crazy, but like shampoo and yeah. conditioner and things like <laughs> that. And so I think that was for her kind of her, um, you know, I, I think it, it's a testament to the supportive environment that she grew mm -hmm. up in. Um, yeah. But Bernie, could you tell us a little bit more about her upbringing and some of her yeah. influences? Yeah. Well, other than having supportive parents, which, which always helps, you know, this telling kids, you know, that you can't do that or something like that. So that helps. But she, what kind of got her going really was um, a really good high school teacher when she was a sophomore high school chemistry teacher named Kelly Paltrock. I guess she's still in touch with her. So, and, and then she was saying about Kelly that she was always full of energy and running around the classroom and doing all these neat experiments. And now if you ever see Kate or her YouTube, she's got like a million subscribers. You should really watch some of the things that she does. I and mean, she's always running and jumping and, you know, doing all these great things. We'll get into some of the details later. So I guess she had a, a teacher to model for that for her in Michigan. So that's pretty good. Um, and then she went to um, university in Ann Arbor. She got a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in German, which I actually know German. So that's good. And the reason kind of, I guess her father was German and then she could talk to her father and her mother didn't know German. Yeah. She could talk about things with her father. So, I mean, that's kind of a funny reason to get a German degree. But... She also said something about how German actually became yeah. really useful. I was surprised that her German was to this level that she said it would be useful, but um, because a lot of chemistry papers are written in German. Right, yeah. So she, she could... That's... That's true. Yeah, I came across. Like if you yeah. could become a singer, you probably want to learn Italian and a lot of operas and German sure. and Italian and so on. So yeah, exactly. That's pretty common. And then she went to University of Texas at Austin in 2014 and got her PhD. But it's really interesting how she got into the whole other field of all the demos and things she mm -hmm. does. So the person that normally would do the demos for that university was taking leave of absence. So either they asked her or she volunteered 
to start doing that. You know, just a little high school demo, things like what you've done, Sarah, with, with your when you were at USM. So the first year, she got to see 20,000 students. I mean, that's, that's not crazy. just doing like one thing a year, one thing a semester, like a solar system ambassador like Seth does and stuff. So she got 20,000 students to give actual demos to. And then um, she went on, she actually was touted as the next Bill Nye because she made appearances <laughs> on the, the Dave program and um, all kinds of other, Colbert, I think she was on as like the scientist with yeah. the crazy things and so on. And, and then she has her own channel and like a million subscribers. Even when she teaches at, at the university, she gets a thousand students per semester. So mm -hmm. she must do some of these big lectures where you have, you know, 500. Right, the general, the general lectures science courses. A week yeah. and she'll have a thousand students. Mm -hmm. So, um, she, you know, she just gets them into it and she doesn't do the high level stuff like for her PhD mm -hmm. degree there. But she'll, she's a lot of fun, I'm sure. She'll do all kinds of demos for them. We've watched a lot of them. We'll talk about some of the things that you guys can try also. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of her background. So that's the. She didn't have a lot of problems like Dr. Hakim Alosei that we covered. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of other problems being African American and then you know the drug dealing and things. So she had, I guess, a probably slightly smoother ride into what what she does. But yeah, she, it does you know, sound like it. I I yeah. do sense that. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that she, well, I don't think it's the biggest thing, but one one part of her kind of package deal, if you will. Mm -hmm. is that she she doesn't kind of conform to this image of what a female scientist is and i mm -hmm. i i don't yeah. think i ever really thought of it this way but i do think that probably in in mainstream media the way that you know a female scientist is portrayed is mm -hmm. kind of they dress a certain way um and i know in in some of her interviews and the things mm -hmm. that she finds important is you know mm -hmm. for her to to teach in stilettos and high heels and yeah. um you know she she always wears like a pencil skirt and you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being very specific about this because she's very specific about this mm -hmm. and um i think her her whole mission in some ways is to show like oh you don't have to conform to this image in order mm -hmm. to you know be interested in this and you yeah. know that you can still have all of these um you know quote unquote not nerdy Mm -hmm. interests and still be mm -hmm. built, yeah. still be a great scientist or still be somebody who yeah. pursues the sciences yeah. so i think that's that's a kind of a different take i think um it's it's obvious in some ways but but mm -hmm. never i don't think ever really um, pointed out super clearly like that yeah and with all the additional things people can do now um, you know, with the YouTube and the different mm -hmm. things they do. And there's some really good ones. There's Derek Muller, there's Anton Petrov, obviously Neil deGrasse Tyson and Star Talk, where I first mm -hmm. saw her. Uh, Bill Nye, of course, and there's so many, you know, then you get a whole nother persona and thing going. And they, you know, they do really well once you get over like a few sure. hundred thousand subscribers. And then that will also help animate and do things. And then you can carry that into the classroom. And you'll already be very different because most regular teachers, you know, they might do a little podcast or something, but they're not going to have a regular YouTube where they have to really produce and become an actor right. and all the other things they have to do with a whole cast around them. Right. To get the nice green screen things to make it all look more realistic. Like there's a guy in England, Brian Cox does a lot of that stuff. Of course, Brian Green, all those people. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. She, she also has an incredibly magnetic um, personality, mm -hmm. super bubbly, super excited, yeah. excited. Yeah. Um, she laughs a lot. Every time she, she does these demos probably, mm -hmm hundred times a year I don't know probably um, thousands yeah because yeah. at one point she she had done you know four in one day so you mm -hmm. know if she's doing yeah. them yeah and she's just always always excited yeah like the first yeah, time like, she didn't yeah. know this was going to happen <laughs> she knows exactly what's going to happen <laughs> but she's still so excited mm -hmm. and you know I I do um one thing that she had mentioned that I thought was uh that I kind of wanted to touch upon was mm -hmm. um uh, yeah, I think there was a question asked of her of how, like, how did it, how long did it take or what was it like for your colleagues to kind of get used to you as being somewhat of a different type of professor? And um, she, this is a quote from her, is that there have been some male scientists who don't really love what I do. There have also been some older women who don't like what I do. Mm -hmm. I have a really cool support system, but it took a second. Sometimes they think I cheapen the science. Mm -hmm. And um, I did want to kind of talk about that, though, because I thought that I, 
I do think that that's kind of interesting to touch upon because mm -hmm. I feel like her approach is is very similar to what I I did. You mm -hmm. know, there's there is a lot of waste, if you will, in in these kinds of demonstrations and mm -hmm. um, science experiments because you are doing things for the sake of learning. And so you're not necessarily producing. There's a lot of by byproducts of waste. Yeah, not doing a new system. research thing. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, and so you know her 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 line there. Sometimes they think I cheapen the science, um, because she's so performative in some ways. Mm -hmm. She is, you know, I think that is probably totally her personality. But I'm sure from from the point of point of view of some people, they're probably like, wow, she's way over the top very you know too excitable um i i wanted to get your your opinion on that burning because yeah. you are a teacher and right. how how much do you feel yeah. like you have to perform yeah and, and entertain yeah. for the right. sake of getting your students excited or or right. is that well, not even something you? oh no no it's a good point and um i think i should do more of it um I think in general, she's not cheapening. She's just making it a broader appeal. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have to do some things over and you have to know the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, I start doing little things like I would pop some balloons with my laser pointer. <laughs> and I would, I, would, I didn't actually juggle for them yet, but I would toss a ball and say how far the Earth moved in that half a second and how far we moved around the galaxy and mm -hmm. some different things they can kind of remember. And I was looking on new little things that I could do. But no, it has to be quite a bit of it. It has to be performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm course mm -hmm. and i should do more of it i mean i made some videos when i had to when we were online but maybe i could carry into that and make some videos that i could just require the students to watch to get a, in a more animated a little different side than when they just start doing the experiment i mean some students are great and you know they'll they'll move around the lab and do stuff all the time and others yeah. will just kind of sit there and you know and they'll just be kind of bored no matter what i do so <laughs> it's it is an important part but it's, it's up to the student a lot too yeah yeah, I, I do think that, um, you know, from her perspective, she's mm -hmm. teaching these giant general, like large lecture hall yeah. courses right. that kind of like you, you're getting students from all different majors who mm -hmm. are, you know, they're not science specific. You know, even when she talks about her dissertation, she kind of, you know, she glazes over that very quickly because <laughs> there's a lot there to, you know, there's years of training to get to that point. Right. And, you know, for, for her sake, she's just trying to yeah. get people excited and not not be turned off ultimately. Yeah. No, it's important. It's probably even more important in the lecture. Like she, I don't do the yeah. lectures because I don't have a PhD. But um, yeah, it's probably even more important than her lecture. But you have a broad audience, broad like broad range of. Students. Oh, I do. Yeah, it was almost no science people because it's kind of a required course. Mm -hmm. And over the year I've been doing this, they would prefer that. I think their options are physics or biology. Okay. So yeah. I kind of have them tell me on the first night why they picked astronomy, and I I tell them you can't just say because it was required. You have to yeah. say why you picked it. Yeah. And if they thought it would be fun, or they always like stars, or they had yeah. something in high school, or it was it recommended to them? And I get some you know, pretty good reasons. Yeah. And yeah. I, but yeah. you're right. I should do some more interesting things like Kate and some of the other YouTube people I've been watching yeah. to make it more interesting. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to suggest that you need to work a little bit harder at your job. Yeah, I know. You took my course actually, but, <laughs> but I am always looking for new ideas and make things a little more interesting. That's that's really good. I think that that's that's a good attitude to have. It is. Um, it's hard to do though. It's very hard to do. Yeah. I mean, when when I was you know working in this in this very area that she is doing, do, going to schools, doing demonstrations, working with our students, it was hard to sometimes even to get students to 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 bother trying things. I think the younger they are, the more the more they were willing to kind of work with you deal with you yeah. and try things yeah. um but man some of the college students yeah. they've it's like they've already been nurtured to to yeah. to know that they they're not good at this or they're not good at that or whatever right. and so they don't even try and that's that's yeah. kind of it's sad to see that progression sometimes but yeah. then you do have some people who who really latch on yeah. um yeah. maybe we could go on to some of her experiments because I think one of one of them, it wasn't so much an experiment. Um, well, I, I guess it was a demonstration, but yeah. she did this on um, Stephen Colbert. And I really like this because I did the same experiment, just not as interestingly in, yeah. in, um, in high school. But essentially, and I think you also do this in some ways in your class, but she had the balloons filled with he, uh, hydrogen. Were they hydrogen yeah. or I think they were hydrogen balloons and um, or maybe they were helium. I don't know which Probably one. Probably helium. I don't think you want hydrogen. 
I think she had one that was a hydrogen and then the rest were probably helium. And then um, each, she had like four or five of them with different um, metals. I think powder, um, the powder of the metals in them. And she basically burned them with her blowtorch. Mm -hmm. And then they, they would pop and then burn. Mm -hmm. No, I think it was hydrogen because they burned. Um, mm -hmm. And they burned um, the different colors of those elements. And so you, oh. you do kind of have that as well in your class. Except... Well, yeah, I do a, a spectrum of gases, but that mm -hmm. sounds like a more interesting, maybe I'll throw that in before that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know yeah. About that. but we did the exact same thing in my chemistry class, except mm -hmm. we had Bunsen burners and then we had mm -hmm. the powder. Um, so it yeah. wasn't as, as dramatic as the way that mm -hmm. she did it. So she basically took the same experiment, but made it so much more fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and, you know, I think the, the, you know, Stephen Colbert, kind of going back to that, that comment was asking her and commented a few times, like, what is, what is the purpose of this? <laughs> what is the utility of this experiment? And, you know, I think that one is a really good one because that's essentially how fireworks are made mm. is all the different powders and how they get all the different colors. So, um, you know, it's, it is all about the fundamentals and, how do you how do you encourage and kind of drive home the understanding of those chemistry fundamentals mm -hmm. so what other experiments and demonstrations is she is she kind of um, known for yes yeah, so i watched five or six of them she has a whole book that covers actually does 25 that people can do actually she's written seven books so that's pretty neat but i like one called glittery magnetic slime so she mixes it all up. I won't give you all the ingredients. You, you can look up the details online. I think effort. everybody yeah. knows what slime is and how to make it at this point. Literally no, yeah. every class was making it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I never did when I was in school. So it was new to well, me. The modern, like nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Even the stuff they use on the game shows for the kids when they dump yeah. stuff somewhere and all that stuff. Well, this is magnetic because she put iron oxide powder mm -hmm. in. And then she has some fairly strong magnets. And then you can just make it reach out like a living blob type thing. And then you can do it and redo it and do all kinds of and pick the whole thing up. So that was a pretty neat one because the color and it was all glittery and everything. Um, and then she does like this magic uh, paper. You can write a message on some paper and then using wax and a few other things. And then some image or something that you write will show up that looks invisible at first. I mean, that's not quite as dramatic. And then she does some really neat ones. One, I think she even wrote a whole book on this, um, birth, the birthday blast off. So mm -hmm. basically all it is, a little bit of hot water and then I don't know how many milliliters of um, the liquid nitrogen. So when you put that in hot water, you can like hide it under, not a real cake, but something that looks like a birthday cake. And then the whole thing will explode at that <laughs> point. And there's a lot of versions on that. You yep. can do a whole bucket of it. And she took 60 other teachers or people at the university. And this is like a world record in the Guinness book. And they all had a bucket and they dumped, I don't know what would get dumped into which. But so it created like a big thundercloud of steam that went like 100 feet high and that 60 people did this at the same time. So that's <laughs> one she would pull on all her demos. That's a good one. And then she would breathe fire. I mean, that's great because one of her books is called um, Dragons Against Unicorns, which is obviously not a real one. That one's interesting because she has a blowtorch, a flame torch, and mm -hmm. she puts cornstarch in her mouth. Yep. So you could yeah. do it with either cornstarch or flour. Flour mm -hmm. has less carbon in it, which is yeah. what um, what kind of creates a large flame and mm -hmm. um she just puts a spoon of it in her mouth and then yeah. blows it all out and then it lights on fire it's pretty yeah. cool and that can be like three or four feet across mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah and then she and i think she even ended her ted talk with that or something mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to add a little drama and i'm sure she's done a lot of ted talks um so though oh and then she does one i guess she says she does this for her students to kind of mislead them so she has a big thing of pink plastic the packing peanuts yep. and she'll pour tap water on one of them and of course nothing happened so just filter down and then she claims she's pouring bottled water on the other one and they all melt and dissolve in a little you know an ounce of liquid pink and then she'll tell them after well that was really acetone <laughs> not the plastic but you think oh bottled water is so different from tap water but that's not really the case so that was a pretty neat one i watched her do that that's very easy you can do that you don't need any special things other than acetone um and then, then she does a neat polymer with shaving cream, kind of puffy pink slime. You can do some neat things. The like, elephant course, toothpaste, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, one of her experiments was called the um, oscillating clock. I don't know if you've seen that one. Uh, no, but, I know, I didn't see that one. Um, she, I can't remember exactly what three, um, three chemicals are used, but essentially there's three chemicals. Mm -hmm. And the way that she describes it is she'll, she'll pour these three chemicals 
and it turns it basically oscillates between um completely black liquid mm -hmm. to completely clear liquid and mm -hmm. it oscillates between that over and over and over again and she describes it as there's three three chemical re two two or three three chemicals in there and a is reacting with b and then it's fighting to react with C, and then C is fighting to react with B. And so they're constantly trying to react with each other over oh. and over again, which causes that oscillation. It's super mm -hmm. cool. That one's actually a very neat. Um... Oh, I should look that one up. I didn't see that one. Yeah. 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 Um, the other thing that, uh, so I don't know any other, I think you pretty much got all of the demonstrations that I also witnessed. Yeah. Um, but I did. One thing that um, surprised me a little bit was that she she made this kind of side comment on one of her mm -hmm. one of her experiments, and she she says, "Oh, um, uh, and uh, you know, not all the air that we breathe out is carbon dioxide. You guys know that it's nitrogen." And I was like, "Wait a minute! Mm -hmm. I don't think I actually knew that." <laughs> mm -hmm. And I yeah. looked it up, and it's actually the air that we breathe out contains sixteen percent of oxygen and four percent of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. it's actually an incredibly low amount of carbon dioxide um yeah. and then obviously the rest is nitrogen but mm -hmm. i was like wait okay <laughs> yeah i didn't know the ratio i knew it couldn't all be co2 because the air is 78 percent nitrogen so we're not going to mm -hmm. suddenly turn all that you know 77 percent into co2 that wouldn't make any sense yeah yeah i didn't know it was only four percent yeah, yeah yeah it's a small yeah. amount so anyway something that i learned from her mm -hmm. just doing this yeah. research Yep. Um, Bernie, do you want to kind of go over some of her books and publications? Yes. Okay, so as I mentioned, she's already written seven books. I think she pretty much started like about 2014 when she started doing the demos on a bigger scale. So a um, couple of them are fiction and some are real. So I'll start with the latest. So this is actually for adults because some are based for kids. So it's called It's Elemental, The Hidden Chemistry of Everything. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good one. Our listeners could try to get or borrow from a library, whatever. It covers the chemistry, everything from doing your workout to going to the beach to going to work and all the regular things you would do. You know, you don't have to do any of these crazy experiments we were talking about. So it's elemental, just the hidden chemistry of everything. Because everything breakfast is basically... to bedtime. <laughs> yeah. So everything is basically chemistry. I mean, what Neil deGrasse said, uh, some of my best friends are made of chemicals. So all of our <laughs> best friends and enemies are made of chemicals. So obviously, you know, everything is chemistry in some sense. Could you also say everything is quantum mechanics and everything mm -hmm. is physics, but you know chemistry is kind of what we're doing with now okay so she's got a, a more imaginative one for kids called dragons against unicorns mm -hmm. and she's one has one called the great escape where she has a 10 year old person who uh, uses chemistry to figure out interesting things and escape and she has a big book of experiments we mentioned some of that and she has one called the birthday blast off basically where she uses the liquid nitrogen and the hot water that we talked about and then i think she has one more but that's pretty good. Seven books for now. That's pretty good. She has um, the awesome book of edible experiments for kids. That's oh, that's right. Yeah, edible, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That one's great, too, because mm -hmm. I did that a lot, too, um, was how do you kind of do some food science? Because that's always both. It's it's delicious. <laughs> right. um, there's there is a product. So there's a purpose to it. And, mm -hmm. and you do learn about some chemistry there. Um, which, speaking of which, I that reminded me of one experiment that we forgot, which was the gummy worms. And oh. she basically has calcium chloride um, as kind of this clear uh, liquid solution and sodium alginate that she uses a squeezy squeeze tube bottle to mm -hmm. squeeze, you know, lines in and you get gummy worms. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. Yeah. Right. All right, so that is our overview of Kate the Chemist. Um, I think you can find her on YouTube. Just do a search. She's got a website and everything. Mm -hmm. um, again, she is a professor over at the University of Texas. Texas at Austin. Yep, at Austin. And very, very fun, super fun personality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when you watch her do demonstrations, you are just – you're just smiling because you are <laughs> you're kind of both happy for her that she's so excited but it's also just super fun to to watch and and learn as well she also just she tries to squeeze as much of the why and the how into like as <laughs> these little bite size you know and these shows are like all right you got to do this quick yeah. and you know she, it's just like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like uh what did you just say <laughs> can't explain everything in a three minute yeah sound I, know, I know 
Um, so she has a really tough job, but we think she does awesome. So mm. shout out to Keep the Chemist, and hopefully if she hears us, maybe she'll she'll come on our show and, and do yeah, it'd be nice to have her or some of the other people we've talked about but didn't actually get on physically with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself and Bernie. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella and from your favorite nerds, just a reminder to vaccinate, to mitigate, and then we can all congregate.